Hello and welcome to the Little Knowledge Podcast with a bit of a spin-off episode today from our Pontypool Park episode. Colebrook, we talked about for about eight minutes and I think it deserves a episode to itself, quite frankly. Um, I'm Paul Busby and with me is Gough Morgan. Now, I have to point out, if you've watched these podcasts, you know one thing about Gough Morgan. He never phones it in. <laughs> Cheeky Except <son. laughs> today. How are you, Goff? I find greetings, everybody. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's greetings to you all. Yes, it's a, it's an interesting one today because, as you know, I am coming via the wonders of telephonic technology. Um, so I'm sitting here looking. What what you can see me in all my glory, which I think is lovely. Um, yeah, I think it's right. And a, a broader view, not just the standard lamp anymore, people. Actually, what's above the door? Oh, it's all new information. It has to be said before we got started, when we were just getting it all set up, he didn't, but it looked as if Goff had knocked the phone over and it was like a, a scene from the Blair Witch Project. Everything <laughs> shook, Goff disappeared, and I got very worried for a moment. But you are all right, aren't you? Yes, I'm perfectly fine. Yes, I haven't been savaged by anything in the woodwork. You're OK. <laughs> now, thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, we're now up to 320, I think. Uh, subscribers. So if you would like to subscribe, it's completely free. Just click if you haven't uh, down below. And even if you want to have a little notification whenever we're doing a live stream or whether a new podcast has been released, press the little bell and that will get you uh, notified uh, extremely quickly. And um, so thank you. We do appreciate every view and every subscribe. But now, did you know, Goff, you have a little bit of a fan? Oh, good Lord. Uh, there's a newish subscriber about a month ago uh, from California. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> and she's rather dedicated. She said that you remind her of her dad, which is nice. Oh, well, that's so very nice. And I oh, guess I'm just nice. there too. But I think <laughs> <laughs> you're an addendum. Yeah. <laughs> I think when I replied well, to her, when I replied yeah. to her, I said it was the equivalent of writing to the Marx Brothers and Gummo replies. <laughs> I think it's you yeah. she wanted a reply from. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I much appreciate it. I'm sorry I haven't been able to reply to you as I normally would have, but here's a little wave. There you are. <sighs> but this is why I mention her. She has watched since finding us uh, because yeah. through genealogy, she's a Morgan along the way. Uh, so very cool oh, yeah. genealogy. Um, she has watched every single podcast we've done. Well, goodness. Well, that requires some form of medal to be struck. I think. <laughs> yeah. Very few people have won one golf. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. <coughs> now we, we are go. going to uh, talk to, like I said, Pontypool Park, which we did uh, a fair while ago now. Uh, yeah. We mentioned for yeah. about seven or eight minutes a sort of an offshoot, Charles Hanbury Williams, who lived at Cole Brooks. So it was a Hanbury offshoot. And yeah. I just thought that he deserved and the property deserved a whole episode to itself because Colebrook House or Colebrook Park near Abergavenny is an extremely important um, mansion, was an extremely important mansion in the county. So we're going to talk about that today, oh, if that's all right. Oh, okay. interesting. Yeah, certainly. It might be, yeah, it's might a, be tricky a new on one phone. To You need well, a little right. if, I, if, I, if I lean and peer in, if you notice. Oh, hang on. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, he's touching it. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> I was expecting a lorgnette, like an Edwardian <laughs> opera goer. But all right, this will do too. Let's do what we usually do. This will be very hard for you, Goff, but not for those watching, yeah. I hope. Yeah. Our old map. So we have Abergavenny. This is, as always, from the National Library of Scotland, where you can interpose um, satellites, modern images oh, yes, over old turn of the 20th century maps. So we have Abergavenny. If you go to the southeast, about maybe a mile and a half, you have Coldbrook Park. And this is what we're talking about today, Coldbrook Park. Oh, yes, there we are. I can see that. Very nice. See it? Yeah. OK, Magnifies it's interesting, well. actually. Coldbrook. Oh, yes, Coldbrook House. Coldbrook Thanks. House. Yeah, there's a lot of springs about, which is probably oh, why they really? built here in the first place. Now, we've talked about springs near country houses before, haven't we, Goff? Well, well, quite, yes. I mean, it, it seems to be, particularly if you've got a house that's based on a very old footprint, one of the main reasons they seem to put up these properties is they have their own water source. 
I mean, the same applies to Tadiga House in Newport, a spring rises in the cellar. Uh, oh, yes, there we are. Reservoir spring over there showing as well. And yeah, Chapel, it's, yeah they say the slope about the house to its south and east abound with springs and some of the water oh, is good. piped underground. And where we've got chapel remains of, that was a medieval chapel, which was later turned into a grotto or bathhouse. So, oh, how interesting. So ah. they're making the most of their spring water in the area, aren't they? Yeah. Were they, uh, I mean, was it considered a holy spring or a healing spring or anything? Before? I haven't seen but it the, mentioned as a holy well, unlike the Tadiga having House. A, having a, what is hard is that ha, having a chapel near a spring always strikes me as sort of significant, even if it's not meant. It always strikes me as, as, as an awful lot of places. You'll find that the, the, the spring is what comes first. And the spring requires a, requires a reputation of healing or whatever. And then you'll find that it'll be um, Christianized and they'll have a chapel place to a local saint or something or whatever. But it generally has a, a, a property of, of, of healing association or religious association with a chapel near it. Yeah, well, quite right. And we know there was, well, we think there was a medieval chapel on that site. And like you say, it's on top of the spring. So I think you're completely hmm. right. But Unless anyone listening and watching this knows otherwise, I don't know yeah. if there is no, a specific no. holy well nearby. It's worth looking into, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah, well, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's suggestive, shall we say. That's the main thing. It's, uh, it's suggestive. Absolutely. Uh, so let's have a little look, as we do, at how things look today. There's Coldbrook House, uh, the stable block, which was probably 17th century. And let's have a little look. Uh, oh, there we go. Completely gone, the house. Yeah, well, yeah, completely gone. The chapel is but still how, there. Yeah, and funny enough, the wood seems to be more or less <laughs> unchanged. The wood survived and the house is gone. Yeah, oh, God. Yeah, and the stable was actually turned into a modern house in about 1985. So they kept the oh, stable, right. they yeah. demolished the house, <clears throat> and uh, we'll learn the reason for that. In fact, Goff, uh, you and I on the Pontypool Park podcast did actually look at photographs of Colebrook House and its demolition. So if it seems familiar to you, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's got deja vu. We have been there yeah. at that point. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, 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 that rings a bell now. But it's a very old site. And we'll start our story in the Herbert Chapel at St. Mary's Priory Church in Abergavenny. The extraordinary so Herbert Chapel. So we're, so we're back to the Herberts then. We are back to the very first Herberts ah. because the progenitors of the entire race of Herberts who in various cadet <laughs> branches sprouted throughout Wales like the springs near Colebrook House. Right, yeah, good. Because what we have here is a very famous man, Sir William App Thomas, and his wife, Gladys. Now, William oh. App Thomas dies in 1445. Gladys then goes to live at Colebrook House and lives until 1454. And they had bards at Colebrook House, uh, some familiar faces for me and you at least, the Goff Lewis Glynn Coffey and Gitora Glynn. Oh, oh yes, yes. Would be housed at Colebrook, so much so that Gladys was known as the Star of Abergavenny. Oh, right. She was also known slightly less realistically as Gladys the Faultless. <laughs> <laughs> but you get what you pay for, really, don't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, Gladys was extraordinary <clears throat> because it was two marriages she had. Her first marriage sprouts off the Vaughans of Tretower Court. She married a Vaughan. Yeah. Her second marriage sprouts off the Herberts, who we've talked about oh, a lot yeah. on our podcasts. Now, why William App Thomas might ring a bell is that he started the building here. Raglan Castle. Raglan Castle. Oh, yep. yes. Oh, blimey. He was the, known as the Blue Knight of Gwent, which was about his armour, not his um, comedy material. The Blue <laughs> Knight of Gwent <laughs> who built the um, Yellow Tower of Gwent, which is this bit here, you might remember. So oh, right, yeah. William App Thomas and Gladys are the progenitors of both the Vaughans and the Herberts, so an extremely oh, important God. couple. Yeah. Now, for, for our story, 
we go to the Colebrook site and the Herbert site, because the eldest son was a William Herbert, a bit of a warrior, and he became the first Welshman to be made an Earl proper, and he was the first mm. Earl of Pembroke. The second son, uh, Sir Roger Herbert of Colebrook, uh, was known as Sir Roger the Tall. So he must have been quite a <laughs> middle <laughs> character. Yeah. And this Mind is you, the- I suppose it, de- it does really depend on the comparison of the people around you at the time, really. <laughs> you probably, probably turned out he was five foot six, <laughs> towering over everyone. <laughs> Goff, there's nothing wrong with people who are five foot six. I'll just point this out now. <laughs> <laughs> what we have here are the four pearls of a baron's <laughs> coronet. And we have the lion, which is the symbol of the time of the Herberts. And we have the order of the garter. Shame on he who oh, thinks of, evil of it. Yeah. On his soir, qui me les pense. Well done. Oh, yeah. And he was, these two, William and a Roger of the Tall, of Coldbrook, um, yeah. were huge figures in Welsh history of the time. Huge figures. They're warriors. It's the Wars of the Roses. Um, and they head off. And at one point, there's only one Lancastrian hell castle left in Wales. And, um, and so they head off to sort of conquer it, really. And on the way, Roger hmm. meets Jasper Tudor and defeats him oh. in Denby. And that castle that would not fall was Harlech. And finally, these two Herberts take Harlech Castle. And uh, Sir Roger of Colebrook seems to be the two, one of the uh, more tender hearted of the two brothers because he wants to pardon some of the men that are left in the castle who have surrendered. And the king says, no, nope, we need to execute them. And Sir Roger says, look, if you do not pardon them, your majesty, I'm going to hmm. send them back to the castle. Oh, and gosh, the king really? eventually backs down. And thanks to Sir yeah. Roger Herbert of Colebrook, um, they were not actually executed so you've got roger oh. slightly tender uh, in the ways yeah. that's by the times and william yeah. the first earl of pembroke slightly more brutal and this is a sort of hmm. um near anglesey there were seven murderous brothers <laughs> seven brothers i don't know why what a family yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah were they all married <laughs> <laughs> seven brides for seven murderers yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> anyway, they were arrested and all seven had to be executed. Um, so Roger uh, and then the, the mother of them said, oh, could you could you save two of them? So I like to think that two oh. of the seven just went along with the others. Yeah, God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so Roger said, yes, we must spare the lives of at least two of this good woman's. She's not can't be that good. I mean, she's brought up yeah. seven murderers. I mean, they learned that somewhere, <laughs> didn't they? Yeah, yeah, something went wrong somewhere there. Yeah. <laughs> Might have been the dad's fault, but but who knows? <laughs> um, and, and basically, and the mother begs for the lives of these two sons. Richard agrees, but William, the Earl of Pembroke, refuses. And at that point, she curses him. And oh, it says... Lord, that's a good curse. It's never good. With a pair of wooden beads at her arms, she uttered a curse and a prayer that the Earl of Pembroke might fall in the next battle. So we get to the that's battle. A, that's an interesting phrasing there, Paul. Do you a think? A curse and a prayer. Yeah. How interesting. And the, the, uh, the beads at the, at the wrist are suggested a rosary as well, aren't they? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What, a, what an interesting little thing going on there. A curse and a prayer. <laughs> well, this stayed Opposite in the mind of, of the, younger, the younger brother, Sir Roger yeah. of Colebrook. Because <laughs> just before the Battle of, some call it the Battle of Banbury in 1469 or the Battle of Edgecote Moor, he was worried. And his brother William asked him, why are you worried, Roger? And he said, lest the curse of the woman with the wooden beads fall upon you. And oh, both gosh. brothers against uh, Warwick, the kingmaker, who had rebelled against them, fought at the Battle of Edgecote Moor in 1469. Oh, blimey. As illustrated by this first-class stamp. <laughs> anyway, it was said that Roger the Tall, again, yes, it's all relative, I agree, um, <laughs> with his poleaxe, went th- twice through the, uh, the enemy, killing 140 men. But, oh, good Lord. But nevertheless, they lost the battle. And both Roger of Colebrook and William the Earl of Pembroke were sentenced to death. 
And at this point, William, who was always firm with this sort of thing, decided that he was going to ask for clemency, not for him, but for his brother, Roger of Colebrook. But there was no mercy from Warwick the Kingmaker, and both were executed. They were both beheaded after the Battle of Edgecote Moor. So these two oh, huge God. figures uh, yeah. were executed. Um, William, Earl of Pembroke, uh, was buried here at Tinton Abbey. Oh, but right. A, but a bit closer to home, Roger was buried in the Herbert Chapel near his father and mother. And here we see Roger with oh, the lion gosh. he's resting on, the symbol of the Herberts, and his wife, oh, yes. Margaret. Oh, yes. It's interesting, actually, when his mum, Gladys of Coldbrook, died, there were 3,000 at her funeral, which in those days is enormous. Well, it's got to be, isn't it? Yeah, colossal. And they said that she was fluent in Welsh and English, which was seen as a a big thing for her. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is is interesting what they do with bardic contests, you know. Um, Gitor Glynn, who we've spoken about in the past, Golf, in fact, you've Performed. Mm. You've uh, declaimed poetry of Gitor Glynn at Raglan Castle, of course. Yes. Yeah. Um, he writes about this house, Colebrook House, and it puzzles me. So I don't know if you've got any opinion. This is what Gitor Glynn writes about Colebrook House of Gladys and Sir Roger Herbert, okay? There are below nine houses in the tower. Above, there are a hundred houses and one tower. A large town in a heap of stone a house laden with small houses. The golden rock is its walls. Its ridge is red like wine grapes. I find it really hard (laughs) to imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm wondering whether... It's a brawling thing. Well, yes, that is correct. It it, it seems to be like a a description more or less of a small town rather than than a, a single building as such, isn't it? Yeah. How, ma- how many buildings were around Colebrook House at that time? I mean, we had well, the medieval exactly, chapel. Yeah, you're, you're talking of a sort of major settlement, really, aren't you? You're not talking of a single property. Yeah. If you yeah, follow the bards. The above and below bit, I'm wondering whether he's talking above and below a hill. Oh, the slope. Above and below, it is, there oh, is oh, a the slope. slope. Above and below the slope. So there, there's, a, there's, a set, there's a settlement at the slope and there's a higher settlement as well. Fascinating. I mean, there, is, I don't know it? if there's been major archaeological studies of around Cold Brook, but it's got to be a candidate, right? Well, definitely. I mean, definitely. I mean, from that statement at all. I mean, obviously, you've got a, there's always an element of of, uh, of exaggeration in some of the praise poetry, but it's it 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 does well, it will carry a kernel of truth about it. So, hmm. and uh, yeah, the depiction of a, of a quite a thriving um, uh, and, and well populated settlement area sounds quite interesting, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And uh, you know what? I think I've been calling him Roger over these last... Why, why is the name Roger in my head? Sir Richard Herbert is who I should be talking about. Where did Roger oh. come from? <laughs> <laughs> I just realised... Forgive me if I've mentioned Roger. I mean, it's Sir Richard <laughs> Herbert. Dear yeah. me. The standard of this podcast has gone downhill, hasn't it? It's plummeted already, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, dear. Sir Richard. I think I, I think I was thinking of Roger Mortimer, isn't you know? Um, Sir oh. Richard Herbert. Let's get yeah. this right. Um, if anyone wants to link podcasts, Sir Richard Herbert is actually the great grandfather uh, father of Lord Herbert of Cherbury. Lord Herbert of oh. Cherbury was the one who lived at inherited St. Julian's. If yeah. you're linking yeah. podcasts. Yeah, that's why you can still get Lord, his uh, his music online. Lord, Lord okay, his music too. online. Now these Herberts continued at Cold Brook, but they seem to be a slightly bloodthirsty lot of descendants. For instance, Uh-oh. there was Rhys Herbert of Cold Brook who fatally wounded a man at Windsor in 1534. There was oh. Matthew Herbert of Cold Brook, an MP. They were all MPs. A violent yeah. man who kept a great store of weapons at Cold Brook and loved to pack the town council. <laughs> the cold brook was the home of generations of slightly violent men you wouldn't want to cross yeah. until we get to the civil war where henry herbert of cold brook goes against the rest of the herberts by becoming a parliamentarian and he oh, fights gosh. on the side of parliament yeah. and it was said that he did so because he wanted to get his hands on a former herbert property which had passed into the hands of the somerset 
family. No prizes for guessing what that actually was. And indeed, after the Civil War, Henry Herbert of Colebrook was given £3,000 by Oliver Cromwell and the plunder of Raglan Castle. Oh, gosh, blimey. <laughs> oh, so he knew which side his uh, bread was buttered then. He got he? his hands on it from the Somersets. Now, as we know, the Somersets yeah. took it over. It should be pointed out, though, that the plunder wasn't just when Henry Herbert owned it, because into the 18th century, the, it was the second Duke of Beaufort who ordered the great dilapidator, Mr. Hopkins, to take 23 staircases from Raglan Castle. Go on. And it wasn't until the fifth Duke of Beaufort at the start of the 19th century that Raglan Castle was stopped being a convenient quarry for nearby yeah, properties. Yeah. Good gosh. So it's not, you know, it's, we are sort of rough on Henry <laughs> Herbert, but, but, um, but the Somersets were probably just about the same, it has to be said. Yeah. Now, the Herberts did run out at Colebrook. They ran out of male children and um, it was put up for sale. And a familiar face for us from Pontypool Park, the great ironmaster John Hanbury. Oh, buys yes, it he is. in 1720. Uh, and he buys it because he got £70,000 from his close friend Charles Williams of Killian, which we talk about on the Pontypool Park uh, podcast. Yeah. And Charles Williams says, look, you can have this money as long as my godson, which was John Hanbury's third son, takes the name Williams. And so the third son, the godson, became Charles Hanbury Williams. And the Hanbury yep. Williamses continue. Now, here he is. Now, this, this man, of course, we could very easily do an entire podcast on him. Um, he was an extraordinary character. Um, and he changed, he changed Coldbrook entirely. He rebuilt it. In fact, somebody wrote, the good old house you like so well is now no more. The whole of the habitation is now upon paper. Such a shifting of plans. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> and such a, there is evidence in the fabric of the yeah. building when they were destroying it that Sir Charles Hanbury Williams frequently changed his mind and left that oh, mark right. on the building. So he was going to do one thing, and then he decided, yeah. nah, we'll do something else. Yeah, gosh. <laughs> now, the reason he's famous and played by Peter O'Toole in the film The Great Catherine is that he was the mentor to the king, the last king of the Poland-Lithuania Commonwealth, um, who was his, uh, Sir Charles was his mentor, and he was a close friend of Catherine the Great. So when he was our man in oh, St. Yes, Petersburg, yeah. I'm very well with Catherine the Great, so much that Catherine did once write, I shall raise statues to you. <laughs> now this is, this is Catherine the Great, one of history's yeah. greatest figures, talking about a man whose home is near Abergavenny. I just wanted to yes, point this a, out. It, it is amazing, isn't it, really? The, the spread of this, of this, uh, this influence of this family. I shall raise statues to you, and the whole world shall see how I praise merit. However, he was a satirist, he was a poet. I think we talked, mm -hmm. didn't we, Goff, about the chance of maybe sometime in the future us doing a Charles Hanbury Williams night with you reciting his rather cheeky poetry. Yeah, yeah, fine, yeah, fine, yeah, doing that would be great fun. Do we do it, do it, do we do it as a bonus episode, a little, a little. Uh, we'll, make, we'll get some music from Lord Herbert as well. We'll have a musical and poetry evening with our <laughs> contributors. Why not? Uh, the set yeah. he was in, if you remember, was the set of Horace Walpole, Lord Holland and Henry Fielding, who was a very well-known character of the time, a bit of a dandy as well. But there's an interesting comment from Walpole who writes that uh, Sir Charles Hanbury Williams, he had in, innumerable enemies, all the women, for he had poxed his wife, all the Tories, for he was a steady Whig, all fools, for he was a bitter satirist, and many sensible people, for he was immoderately vain. <laughs> well, I, think, I can't think there's anybody he's left out. There's no one place. left. There's no one left. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel Johnson didn't like him. He said he had no fame, but from the boys who drank with him. Bit bitter, uh -huh. Sam, I have to say. Bit bitter there. Um, but extraordinary character. He left his mark on history from his time in St. Petersburg. And I do feel sorry for him. He did rebuild Colebrook House the way... Um, let's have a look how it looks. This is how he rebuilt it. Uh -huh. We have an image of it from his round about his period. Oh, it was yeah. thought, so he's got this modern uh, front, yeah. 
got a new porch with Doric columns, but there's an awful lot of sprawl and a lot of um, Sir Richard's old house still attached here somewhere. They used to yeah. think that the two towers um, may have been the old ones, maybe Gito or Glynn mentioned, but when it was knocked down, they realised they were made out of brick. Ah. So they were the creation of Sir, uh, of Sir Charles Hanbury Williams. Um, but an extraordinary character, and his end was very sad. Because in 1758, he became very ill, and he came back to Britain, and he used Colebrook House as his sanctuary. All his um, licentiousness was in London. He'd come hmm. back to Colebrook as his, um, his safe sanctuary, really. So many people yeah. wanted to challenge him to a duel because of his indiscreet poetry and satires and lampoons, that every so often he'd say, I've got to go back to Monmouthshire. <laughs> <laughs> and he redesigns it and he builds a new library and it, it, it's wonderful uh, what he actually does with the place but it's his oasis of peace it's his oasis of calm hmm. but he's clearly mentally unstable at this time and on the way back home to britain he falls from a ship into the uh, into the hold and hurts himself even more he's declared insane at one point Oh, he goes back to Colebrook, and after a few months at Colebrook, he seems to recover his senses, as it was said. But sadly, November 1759, at the age of 50, it would appear that he committed suicide at Colebrook House, and this extraordinary oh, yeah. man's career came to a shuddering halt. Mm. He's buried at Westminster Abbey. But there's a curiosity with this, which I think surely by now needs to be rectified. Horace Walpole wrote the dedication for his tomb. But because it was suspected or known that he'd killed himself at Colebrook House, you will not find one inscription to Sir Charles Hanbury Williams in Westminster Abbey, even though he's buried there because he was a suicide. Oh, really? Good Lord. I mean, it's... Um... <laughs> I mean, at the time, you weren't even buried on consecrated ground if you were a suicide. So, True. I mean, that's quite interesting. So, that was, so obviously, they, they've, they've got some form of compromise. You can bury him, but we won't memorialise him. That's, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, time is, yeah perhaps we should, we should start a campaign to get the Horace Walpole epitaph uh, put up properly for him somewhere. Or just his name somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in Westminster <coughs> Abbey. He must be one of the only people in uh, yeah. modern times, and by modern I go back to the 17th and 18th century, to be buried there, but whose name does not appear anywhere. He's the sort of man, yeah. Walpole said, that might have earned a little bit of room in Poet's Corner, but his name oh, is God. not allowed in any part of the Abbey. Is that a little knowledge podcast campaign starting, God? I thought, well, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit sad, isn't it, really? You know, yeah, yeah. It's your yeah, time change, I suppose. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. Well, let's think about that. Yeah. He did not have any, he had two daughters. One very sadly, Lady Essex, died um, unfortunately the same year, which probably did not help. And so his brother George, and I don't know why, we've got a portrait of George. There's so many interesting characters we don't have a portrait of. But for mm. some reason, one of the portraits that survives is of George Hanbury Williams. And there he is. Uh -huh. He took over at Cold Brook and he was there for a while and the Hanbury Williams is carried on into the 19th century. Uh -huh. Where we take up a man who was there for a long time, okay, and his name, I don't know where it comes in the family tree, Ferdinand Hanbury Williams. Was Ferdinand? The, Ferdinand, yeah, was the Victorian um, uh, Hanbury Williams who stayed at, uh, at Cold Brook. He was there. Uh, he lived right up until 1887. So he really was there for a very long time, died at the age of 88. Seemed to be a very popular local landlord. His tenants gave him a silver cup. He gave them a 10 percent rebates on rents when harvests were bad oh. in the 1850s. Hmm? Um, but the interesting thing about Ferdinand Hanbury Williams, which, which I find interesting, is that he seemed to be intrigued by the sinister aspect of Coldbrook House. Oh, yes. So we've got a view of it here in the 19th century. There's the slope, you see. So it, you might yeah, have been right, yeah. Goff. Quito may, Quito may have been mentioning the towers on the slope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because he says of it that um, there are two rooms. There is one room that is haunted, but the only people who ever see the ghost are Hanbury Williamses. 
<laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> Guests never see it, but you stick a Hanbury Williams inside that house and they will mm. see the ghost. Now, I think Ferdinand kind of assumed it was a Herbert ghost, frustrated that the Hanbury Williamses had taken over. Yeah. The house. yeah. <laughs> but there's also one which I particularly like, and I hope they put this name. I hope it was in common usage. I hope this name was on the, uh, you know, the bell systems and the bell pulls because it was called the, the blood-stained blood room. <laughs> Now, <laughs> this was because there was indeed, you hear about this in houses, but this seems to have been yeah. true. There was a dark stain on the oaken floor, which appears to have been proven to be blood. And it was proven a, to be blood. Well, it, it was presumed to ah, be right. blood. Yeah. Um, we don't know, but clearly they seemed. And there were two possible reasons for this. Yeah. The first was that it was used to be the card room. And uh, it's interesting that they were the Herberts and the Hanbury Williamses were playing cards there one evening, as the story goes. And there was an argument. They got their swords out and one of them was killed in that room by the other, by the thrust of a sword and the blood stain soaked into the oaken floor of the card room. Mm. I find it uh, the fact that there were Herberts and Hanbury Williams seems fanciful to me. It seems to just go with the history of the house, doesn't it? Yeah. But another one which Ferdinand confirmed to Bradney, who was the, a great historian in Monmouthshire at the turn of the 20th century, that what actually happened was that a butler had tender feelings towards the maid. And the butler sort of. Um, pledged his trough, so to speak, and the maid turned him down. And in a fury, the butler murdered the maid, oh. thus creating oh. the bloodstain. Now, this is the unpleasant story that Ferdinand Hanbury Williams actually subscribed to. That's what he told Bradney. It's not pleasant, is it? Well, no, no, no. Well, well I mean... <laughs> Neither of them are pleasant, but the second one is particularly unpleasant. Yeah, it's how interesting. Interesting. I mean, what does give a sort of credence to bloodstains on the floorboard business is that we often, we're used to places being carpeted, whereas a lot of the times they weren't in that period, were they? Very true. So you would have you would you would have had bare oaken boards which were polished under the so it could have it could have done it. Um, uh, hmm. Hmm. There were so many houses, though, with so many stains on the, on the floor, <laughs> yes. all of which are blood, you know, and you go, oh, dear me. <laughs> You're very, that's very true. I mean, Ferdinand had a bigger... He died in 1887. His son was Ferdinand Capel Hanbury Williams. And Ferdinand oh. Capel Hanbury Williams really had slight problems with his... Uh, well, for his daughter, this is a fascinating story. I stumbled upon utterly accidentally. Her name was Ada Lucy Hanbury Williams. And Ada had reached the age of 25, 26. And this is in the, uh, uh, in the 1880s, 1888 to be precise. And he takes her to Leamington to see more of the world. I mean, how closeted was Ada? <laughs> Well, quite, yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well exactly. Leamington was a, it was a spa town at the time, so it might have been necessarily a tad, uh, a tad exotic. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're not talking the height of spa towns in the 18th century, but they were still a little bit more. You, you, you saw a lot more company and a lot more diversity of people around you would have seen you in where you were living in Coldwell. The father, unfortunately, found out something unpleasant while he was there. He discovered that love letters had been passed between Ada and her groom, a man oh, called good. James Levy. James Levy, the groom. Now, the, the newspapers um, are particularly keen. At height appears to be a sort of motif of this particular episode yeah. because the, the newspapers are keen for us to know that this groom, James Levy, was 19 years of age yeah. and two inches shorter than Ada. Oh, gosh. <laughs> they were emphatic about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so the, suggestion of the, the suggestion at the time was always that, you know, the, the, the gentleman was taller than the ladies, wasn't it? So they're, oh, yeah. they're impu 
They're imputing something, imputing something about his background and origins, basically, you know, the lack of nourishment and all this sort of business being poorer. On the, it won't surprise you, Goff, that at this point, I'm on the side of the groom. <laughs> but any sympathies I may have had quickly dissipates when you find out what oh. comes next. Oh, dear. Um, so what uh, the father does is send her back to South Wales. Um, but James Levy, the groom, follows her. And they go back to the house where they're living. And they tell the servants that uh, Le uh, James Levy is a cousin. And the servants know no better, so they treat him like a cousin of Ada. And it's at this point that she packs up her clothes and packs up things and escapes through a window like this. Oh, <laughs> Obviously, she had time to stand there for 10 minutes while the photograph was taken. Yeah, this isn't Ada, <laughs> but I, I thought it was illustrative. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let us just take a snap for posterity, darling. <laughs> Do you know what, Goff? In this age of Instagram, you just know that any elopement would be put on the internet in uh, agonising detail. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> so they rush then to uh, Cubbington in Warwickshire, where um, Levy was from, and they get married. The father oh, comes back home. He sees what's happened. He dashes to Cubbington, only to find he's too late. And the two young lovers have married. It was supposed to be secret, except Levy was swanning around Cubbington telling everyone because he was so proud of his rich bride that he'd bagged. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, he was already engaged. Such a cad, uh, oh, this man. Oh, definitely, yeah. He was engaged to a cook called Alice Wright, who'd handed in her notice at the property she was working, thinking she was going to marry Levy, and she only found out that her fiancé was married when she was sent a slice of wedding cake. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Oh, oh. It's bad. He's not, he's not quite a charmer, is he? Do you know me? No, <laughs> he is not. And in 1890, we know he is not, because he was done for assaulting his wife. Oh, gosh. Ada was apparently beaten up, um, not for oh, the first gosh. time. He was quoted as saying two things by the by the press. He was quoted as saying, I will whip you like your brother whipped me at Leamington. Oh. And he also said that if he ended up in prison, he would murder Ada. Oh, God. Ada fled to a neighbor's and the charming groom, James Levy, threw a brick through the window. He was arrested and he was given three months hard labor. And they were separated. This mm. was in 1890. Yeah. But, Goff, my great concern is that we know, I don't know any details, so I'm very worried. Because in 1891, yeah. Ada dies at the age of 28. Oh, dear. Now, I don't know how she dies. So if anyone yeah. out there knows how yeah. Ada, I guess, Levy dies in 1891, do let us know, because I'm extremely concerned. <laughs> I hope it's quite, natural, yeah. but there was a threat, you know, under a year before. Oh, yeah. And he's out of out of prison by then, I presume? He only had three months. Oh, God, I wonder. Oh, dear me. That's a, yes, that's a rather dark uh, prospect, isn't it? Yeah, I do apologise for getting dark. It was a terrible year, actually, because 1891, yeah. um, Ferdinand Capel Hanbury Williams dies as well in his 50s, and so does his son, um, Richard Hanbury Williams, and he dies because he had a bad tooth. Oh, oh, yeah. It is amazing the things that could carry you off at that period prior to uh, prior to antibiotics. That's why we're we're so concerned now about um, antibiotic resistance building up. Yeah, you could die of toothache. Well, you, could, you get you get an abscess in your tooth, it could kill you. Except the well, it did. It inflamed. So they took him. He was a, a soldier. They took him to uh, to have an operation, and he died under chloroform. Oh, God. So it's just a horrible way for the Hanbury Williamses to end their association with this part of South East Wales. And, and then they actually did because a lady, Lanova, uh, bought the house. And then from her, this chap bought the house and his name is Sir Arthur Herbert. Uh -huh. back. The Herberts are back. Yeah, he was the brother of uh, Lord Treoin of Lanarth Court. And uh, oh, he was an extremely great diplomat, just like Sir Charles Hanbury 
Williams was, for instance, he worked in St. Petersburg, Washington, Buenos Aires, Tehran, Brussels, Bern, Stockholm, and he was our first ambassador to the independent Norway. Oh, gosh, blimey. It actually says oh, wow. he was a British minister injured in a carriage accident, and they think that was the first use of a motorised ambulance in Norway. It's when Sir Arthur Herbert had an accident. Good grief. So it's another great diplomat living at Colebrook. Yeah. And he married um, Helen Gamble, this lady here, and they were married in Newport. Oh, right. Not our Newport, Newport, Rhode Island. She was an American heiress. <laughs> oh, your teeth, Busby. I know. <laughs> I love the fact it says this is World War I, and it says prominent Americans who are sending comforts to British soldiers in the trenches. Well, it's prominent Americans and Sir Arthur Herbert, basically. And Sir Arthur Herbert, yeah. <laughs> he sort of tagged on. Was she a, what they call a dollar bride? Do you know what? I'm, I don't know enough about her. I'm sure she brought a fair amount of cash into the family, but I don't think she was Jenny Jerome or any of these enormous... <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? Because there's a lot of the aristocratic families are starting to get a bit strapped for cash around about this period. And yeah. one of the best ways you can pull it off is to marry an American heiress. Too right. I don't know if Helen was particularly one of them. Uh, yeah. I hope it was sort of for love. He did work in Washington as well as a diplomat, so it might have oh, met well. there. Yeah. Um, but I think it was a it was a good match. What I like about Sir Arthur Herbert, he did add another wing on to Colebrook House, but he liked pottering around the other bits of Colebrook House. And you sort of tap the panel in or tap the plaster. And if it's hollow, he would explore it. <laughs> oh, gosh. So he found all kinds of interesting bits. Here's an example. Here's the house at the time that Sir Arthur Herbert and uh, Helen were living there. Yeah. And this, it's very hard for you on your phone, Goth, but I'm sure it's okay for those watching on YouTube. This yeah. is his smoking oh, yeah. room, and he sort of behind the plaster found the, this fireplace, a double fireplace in the older oh, part yeah. of the house. Yeah. Oh, yes. In the other <laughs> bit of his smoking room was this arched yeah. doorway. Oh, gosh. And some people actually think that Parts of that house were from Sir Richard Herbert's, the Tall's house, but some suggest they might be 13th century. Oh, no, that's interesting. Even older. Yeah, that's interesting. They were absorbed into the first building, isn't that interesting? So when did they, you know, when did they start to, uh, who first lived on this ancient site of Cold Brook? Not quite, yeah. Amazing. Anyway, so Arthur dies in 1921 and Helen continues living there for 30 years. So oh. Helen Lady Herbert continued living at Colebrook House for about yeah. 30 years. We've got a lovely little snap here, actually, because we've got Helen in the middle at Colebrook with actors. Oh, yes. Lots of actors and her uh, daughter in law, Mary, you can see there. Yeah. And a big dog. But there was drama golf. Now, normally, you do this sort of thing better than me. If we, if you were, if you had your computer fixed and everything was well, then this yeah. would be the golf Morgan segment. <laughs> because Welsh mansion mystery, Burmese idol stolen, lady locked in room, valuables untouched at Colebrook. It really oh, is your right. kind of story. This is, yeah. Oh, dear me. Bur I mean, you've got a Burmese idol. I mean, really, you're, you're laying it on there, aren't you? That's a proper little pot boiler of the period, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> Lady locked in room. So what, are, what's, what is this then? What's going on here? Okay. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I sit up with a greater degree of interest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the Hanbury Williams and the Herberts don't interest you at all. But now we've got to a stolen Burmese idol. You wake up. Is that the case? <laughs> well, this was in June 1929. And what happens is somebody breaks in through one of the larger windows on the ground floor. And they steal from this room, the entrance hall, a 22 inch tall Burmese idol, ignoring all the other more valuable items around them. Um, that's very suggestive. Another thing that's odd is before they steal it, they nip upstairs and they lock yeah. Helen Lady Herbert in her bedroom. 
Now, the, 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 this is more interesting than it sounds because her door had lots of hangers on the outside and lots of switches and lots of levers. Now, one of them locks the door. She was locked in. The next morning, the butler realizes this and he sees a, a chisel near the window where they got in. They appear to have tried to leave through another window, but failed. They did not leave through the front door. No. And all they took was this 22 inch Burmese idol. What's your thoughts? Well, the fact that they seem, they evidently have no, some knowledge of the layout of the house, don't they? Mm. Because they they know which, A, which room is hers and this this lock, how to, how to actually lock this mechanism. So this it's got a hint of an inside uh, job or an inside connection with it. Also, they're going for one specific item, yeah. which means they must have knowledge. A knowledge of what's in the house. You know, the, the, so it sounds as if that item has been stolen. Uh, I well, on request almost. It's one of those things. Somebody's a collector after that type of object that sent somebody in using the connections to go and get it. That's a possibility. Um, so this idol never turns up anywhere again. It's never it goes and it's never discovered, I presume. As far as I know, it, it wasn't. Now, my initial reaction to all of this, when I read the initial articles, was like you. They knew the, the complicated lock-in mechanism on the front door. Oh. They knew the idol. It seems to have been stolen to order. Uh, but I thought, well, because it seems to be someone who knows the property very well, um, Maybe uh, it was a silly idea that maybe someone my original idea was someone had smashed the idol, a servant, and had tried to cover it up by, you know, faking a burglary. That came to an end when I found out that the 22 inch idol was made out of wood. Ah, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't yeah, smashed. Yeah. No, no. And it's wood because it's not even if it's like a sort of, you know, gold glittering object which could be melted down and sold. No. No. So it's yes, it's taken for it, it's taken for a very specific reason that idol, isn't it? Uh, I may possibly to return it to where where it came from if it, if, it, if it was yeah. a religious significance. But it's definitely whatever connection somebody would have a connection with the house and knows the interior of the house. Um, it's gone off to somebody that wants it specifically. Well, there is an official um, solution, or at least what the chief constable of Monmouth should believe, as he weighs in on it and adds extra evidence a few days later. First of all, the newspapers went with the fact that it must be a Burmese religious sect that just wanted to get the idol, which Sir Arthur Herbert, from his diplomatic postings, had brought from Burma, you see. That must have it. That did strike me that it's a possibility of that. But... Um, the chief constable pointed out another interesting thing. that All the glass in the window that was smashed to get in fell on the outside. Oh, well, they're, they're, you're back into an, inter, an inside job then, aren't you? They're basically trying to yeah, make it look like a burglary, whereas it's not. The chief constable put it down to mischief from someone mischief. who worked at the house. It you're not be. convinced. Well, actually, to be fair, actually, that it, it could be, it could be, it could very be, could be that as well. Um, but why, why that particular object? You know, why that particular? The object is still significant in the, in the fact that the way it was chosen for some reason. It does. It is. I mean, it's very clear. If the you know, if the glass is on the outside, then it was knocked out from the inside, which means it was a fake burglary. So it's not. It's not a. That's why they didn't go out the door. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it would even actually left the house at any point. <laughs> no, it's. Uh, I mean, I guess we'll never know. But I just thought it was a curious little case, wasn't it? It is very. It is very. It, it, the the connections of an inside job are very very clear. Um, but perhaps, yeah, it may, it may be that uh, the chief constable was onto something in the second argument in the second uh, uh, theory there, actually. Yeah, Lady Herbert refused to comment on the whole case. Ellen decided she didn't want anything to do with it. So whether she knew something, I mean, I don't know. But this is a curious little case. Around about the same time, there were idols being stolen elsewhere. That's the interesting thing. 
whether that put that in the idea of a mischievous servant, but again, it's an odd thing to choose. It might have been a fashionable thing to steal, I don't know. Well, yes, yeah, I mean, if they're going elsewhere, they must have been a market for them. Yeah. Well, anyway, Helen uh, did have a surviving son, um, uh, John Herbert, who you see here at Coldbrook, with a very unimpressed baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Baby's looking at him thinking, I would not vote for this man. <laughs> John Herbert was an MP for a while. Uh, he didn't live full time at Coldbrook House. Um, in fact, he lived at Lanover House um, oh, right. for a while. And uh, he became the governor of Bengal. And in fact, he died in India in 1943. So Helen, his mum, continued living uh, at Coldbrook until she died in 1951 and then they had a decision to make of course the decision that we have seen all too often through all these podcasts Goff. oh yeah yeah and yeah, they had a huge it. sale everything was sold that they could possibly sell uh and they decided that it really had to be demolished so that we've got photographs now that we have seen before on yeah. our Pontypool cast podcast, but it's interesting to look at it through fresh eyes, knowing the property a bit better. Yeah. So there we are. See, this, this the Charles Hanbury Williams put in this porch. You've got these Doric columns. It's extremely 18th century, very fashionable. I mean, it still looks pretty good. This is just before it was demolished. Oh, gosh, yeah. It's an interesting property, this one. Yes, isn't it? Oh, dear. Oh, yeah, you can see how the, 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 yeah, the old squish up there. Oh, gosh. I hope some of these fireplaces was, you know, were taken out before they uh, they blew it up, Goff. Like Lanwern, they blew it up. I know they blew it up. That's the most amazing thing. You don't just knock it down. You just... <laughs> it was the Good 50s Lord. in Monmouthshire. It was the style of the time. <laughs> Good grief. Dynamite mad we were. That's astonishing, isn't it, really? But this is really good condition, isn't it? Such a yeah. loss. Really good condition. Yeah, it doesn't And seem to this, be house. if you remember the little photograph of uh, Sir Arthur Herbert's smoking room. Yeah. There this is the pointed uh, doorway. Yeah. I love this old bit of the building. This is what I'd be interested in poking around in. Yeah. Apparently, they used to have... Um, there's a fire back here, which I think says 1643 or 1645 on. They used to have a sundial in the garden from 1630. It said, long life to King Charles. Because they were parliamentarians, <laughs> weren't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. You get down into the... Yeah. Oh, oh dear. And again, this is just before they destroyed it. Oh, gosh. It's... Uh... It's pity it couldn't have gone to some other use. Oh, is that, that that double fireplace? I think it must be, you know. I think it's the double fireplace, which may at one point have been part of the kitchen of the old house, maybe. Oh. And this. Oh, my goodness me. Now, we're told that this, to, to make your heart break even more, was originally taken from Raglan Castle. Um, so that's going back a long way. I mean, I have no evidence that that was safe. No. Such a shame. So there it oh, is, yeah. just Gosh. before knocking it down. This is a massive part of Abergavenny's history. It's <laughs> Herbert's now the <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot. We've seen a number of houses go like this, but and things. Like, and but it, you know, it, it, at least it makes you lucky that some places did survive as schools and survive as hospitals and things like this, isn't it? Because that, I mean, that was a perfectly intact, you know, and uh, building which could have had a an extended life somewhere, but nobody, mm. nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted to take it on. <laughs> <laughs> the dynamite oh, has done its work. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Do you know what? I've zoomed in on this, hoping, well, not hoping, but hoping I don't see bits of marble from fireplaces. There's a lot of wood at the front here, and, and there's a bit of me that says, are any of these planks of wood, does it have a dark stain upon it? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. And all of it was torn down. Yeah. And almost forgotten about, really, sadly. Well, quite, yeah. 
But this chap is interesting because what the Hanbury Williamses did after they left Cold Brook and the Herberts took over again, they got rid of the Williams bit of their name, a lot of them. Oh, that right. was part of the deal from John Williams of Killian to get Cold Brook and the 70 grand to begin with. So when they yeah. lost Cold Brook, they thought, we'll go back to Hanbury. Don't need the name anymore. Don't need the name anymore. But this chap was born, I think, in 1892, 1893. He was the director of court holds and the director of the Bank of England. He married the granddaughter of President Ulysses S. Grant, which is quite notable. Really? He was High Sheriff of London. He served four monarchs from George V to Elizabeth II as the gentleman usher. And he lived, to the, uh, lived until 1965 when he died. But his name is what sprang out to me. He was a grandson of Ferdinand Hanbury Williams, and his name was Sir John Coldbrook Hanbury Williams. Oh, go! Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> So it yeah. ended with at least one member of the family, not just carrying on the name of Hanbury Williams, but carrying on that ancient name of Coldbrook. Yeah. Well, well, well. Good. So there we are. That was Coldbrook House. Yeah, fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. You can always tell the bits that are Goth Morgan bits, though. I always feel slightly uneasy doing things like murders and burglaries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything to do with yeah, the supernatural curses or real crime. I'm your boy. I'm in there. <laughs> now, I have got actually something for those of you who are watching this on the day it's released or a few days before. I have got a little bit, whether I might want to try a little bit of a live stream, maybe this weekend. We haven't talked about this off camera yet because I visited the Hendra recently and I've got oh, lots yeah. of questions. At Lord Clangattock's Chamber of Horrors. So um, if I can convince Goff, I don't want to do yeah. it without him. If I can convince Goff to pop along maybe Saturday evening, we might be back for a few questions to ask you on a live stream, but we'll see how that goes. But yeah, are you both. feeling okay now, Goff? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just um, in context, yes, I've just, I've just today you mean declared free of COVID. I had, I've had a COVID outbreak, so... But uh, yeah, no, I'm fine. I'm just a tad snotty, but apart from that, hope I wasn't sniffing too much and oinking all the way through this. One. <laughs> I think you've done a great thing to have filmed it on your phone, which 10 yeah. years ago would have been the equivalent of filming it through a potato. Yeah, I think quite, yeah. um, I think it's, it's it's gone OK, I think. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yeah. OK, well, thank you all for joining us. And uh, I'm sure we will be uh, we'll be back soon with something. Um, yeah. So thanks a lot. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.